Odyssey. Now, from the Signature Bank Studios, this is Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan Proft and Amy Jacobson. America First with Sebastian Gorka. Today at 3, right before Sean Thompson at 4 on AM560. The Answer. Top of the morning, Dan and Amy. Uh, former House Speaker Paul Ryan was on uh, this unwatchable CBS morning show. We watch it so you don't have to. Uh, he was asked about, of course, the Trump indictment and um, the cultural issues that uh, may or may not be important. That was the question in the upcoming election. Here's what uh, former House Speaker Paul Ryan had to say about where his focus is and ostensibly where the party should be. Can I get your thoughts on that movement just quickly? I know we have to go, but Republican lawmakers around the country are pushing legislation when it comes to banning books. Um, it could be trans rights, call it anti-woke, or however you want to label it. Is that a good approach, a good strategy? You're a football fan. Is that the way you should approach it? Yeah, I'm, I'm not a culture war guy. Uh, I think it's really polarizing. Look, I, on some of these issues, I'll side, uh, you know, with the anti-woke crowd. But to me, I'm worried about a debt crisis. I'm worried about, you know, the future of our country and, and China. There are big policy problems that we need to tackle if we want to have a great 21st century for this country. Um, my work at AEI Notre Dame and my Poverty Foundation is all about poverty and upward mobility. You know, what I worry about are the big policy challenges that are going unresolved or made worse by Joe Biden. So that's why I want to win this election so we can actually fix these big policy problems. Yeah. Cultural war politics is good primary election politics. It's very divisive, but it's effective very politics. It's effective politics. I'll grant you that. But for me, I'm an old Jack Kemp guy. I believe in inclusive, aspirational politics, solve problems. We got we got huge problems. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what we got a debt saying, crisis coming. Saying, so we got to get on top of that. To neither Biden or Trump are good on this issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, this is a false line, in my view, that he draws. He's describing America that doesn't exist as if you can se separate economic man and woman from cultural man and woman, particularly against the backdrop of the left's assault on parental rights at the federal level as well as the state level. You know, when the FBI is targeting people based on their political beliefs or their peaceful political activism in the case of pro-lifers uh, or attending the Latin mass in the case of Catholics, you can't just, oh, I just want to focus on uh, entitlement spending and tax policy. It doesn't work that way. Uh, in part, although I have some respect for Paul Ryan's policy chops, why he was such an ineffectual speaker. There is no retreating because if you haven't seen lately, the left is happy to chase you. There is nowhere to run. At some point, you have to stand and fight for these things because, frankly, for example, I think the residents of California, even a state as lost as California, I think for them at least the, the sane residents of California, the prospect of the state taking away their children if they're not sufficiently enthusiastic about LGBTQ, I think that's more important than whether the, the federal marginal income tax rate it goes up or down by a percentage point or two. You know what I'm saying? For more on all this, let's uh, enlist another former House Speaker. He is Newt Gingrich also a former presidential candidate as well, and New York Times bestselling author of the recently released March to the Majority, the real story of the Republican Revolution. Speaker Gingrich, thanks for joining us again. Appreciate it. No, listen, I'm, I'm delighted to be with you, and I think uh, the point you're making is extraordinarily important. I mean, we're in the middle of a cultural civil war in which the left would use the power of the government to force the rest of us to change radically or be faced with jail time. And I think it is one of the most extraordinary moments in American history. Not only jail time, but taking your children away if you don't give your kids what they want? Or, or give your kids what the teacher told them they should want. Uh, this is why parental rights is so important. And, you know, the, the, uh, the irony is that if you want to unify Americans, cultural issues actually help. Uh, we have a project, it's called America's New Majority Project, which people can see at americasnewmajorityproject.com. And we, uh, since, 19, since 2018, we've been doing extensive polling and focus groups. 84% of the country believes parents ought to have the right to know what's happening with their children. 84%. 11% uh, disagree, 
and 5% are undecided. Now, if you have an, uh, this is pure Reagan. If you have an 84 to 11 issue, yeah. uh, you, all, you, you, know, you campaign on it. You don't hide from it. Uh, and, and that's where, I guess, Paul and I disagree profoundly. I think he misunderstands that cultural value issues are not divisive for most Americans. Uh, you know, flying the American flag is not divisive for most Americans. Believing that the content of our character is more important than the color of our skin, to quote Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. from his speech, which has the 60th anniversary this August, that's not divisive. Ninety-two percent of Americans agree. Two out of three black Americans do not think you should discriminate in favor of African Americans. They think everybody should be treated equally and not have a new kind of discrimination plan. Uh, and, and the rest of the country agrees by even bigger margins. So I think it's a big mistake to think that just because the left is noisy and because they're intense and because they're ruthless, to think that they represent the average American. They don't. Well, and, and we just had a real-world example of this. It's not like a laboratory experiment. Glenn Youngkin's election in Virginia. I, I don't know why we don't learn the lessons from that when parents from liberal enclaves like Fairfax and Loudoun County moved over, not in mass, but in sufficient numbers to put Glenn Youngkin in the governor's mansion there. So, And that was all about parental rights uh, with respect to school curriculum and COVID policy. Well, I, I just did a newsletter at uh, Gingrich360.com. Uh, which I do. I do three free newsletters a week. And I just did one on Trump, uh, Bud Light, Target, and the and the Dodgers sponsoring a anti-Catholic hate group. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, the country's reaction to Bud Light selling out on transgenderism, and the country's reaction to Target trying to sell children's clothing on transgenderism. And then the country's reaction to literally a vicious anti-Catholic group who dress like nuns and have contempt for the women who around the world are providing health and education and other services. Uh, the country gets it. And uh, in that sense, right, what's happening to Trump is part of a national pattern of the left trying to say to the rest of us, do what we tell you or you will be punished. Uh, what, what What is your handle on where Trump is at today and where he is vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the field? I mean, given uh, that this will be the focus of the primary season almost uh, inexorably, and given you, he, he still may be indicted one more time in Fulton County, Georgia, um, how does anybody else, Ron DeSantis or any of the other candidates, how, how do they make space for themselves? Well, actually, he'll be indicted two more times. He'll be indicted in Atlanta, and he'll be indicted in the District of Columbia for for January 6th. Uh, and the District of Columbia, of course, voted 5% for Trump. So 19 out of 20 people uh, in the jury pool are anti-Trump. Uh, I mean, it's, it's just, it, it's, it is such an amazingly rigged game. And I think from Trump's standpoint, you know, when you get multiple indictments, what you tell the American people is it's all political. Right. Uh, you have a Democrat. You have a Democrat district attorney in New York, a Democrat district attorney in Fulton County, Georgia. You have a Democratic Je Department of Justice uh, coming after you in two different states. Uh, what that tells the average American is, uh, as, as one guy said recently, I now know how important Trump is because they're that afraid of him. Wow. But but, but so then, what about the space? How does DeSantis get in on this action? How, how does anybody depose him I, as the nominee, I, I, or can I, I, they? I think if Trump does not have a major health problem, and so far there's, there's no sign of it, he, he seems to thrive on combat. Uh, if he stays healthy, I don't see how anybody else in the end gets to play. Uh, because think about it. They go out to raise all this money. This is what happened in 2016. People like Jeb Bush and uh, John Kasich and others would raise lots of money to run ads. Trump would go and do an hour on, on, on Hannity for free. Uh, and, and just drown them. I mean, uh, you know, so Trump gets uh, two or three weeks of coverage for Miami. Then he's going to get a couple weeks of coverage for Atlanta. Then he'll get a couple weeks of coverage for the District of Columbia. Mm -hmm. And what it says to his base, which is which is probably the last number I saw was 63% of Republicans. Uh, what it says to his base is you are betraying him if you don't stick with him. You're, give, you're allowing the left to win. If you don't stick with it. Well, 
that's a pretty powerful battle cry. Mm -hmm. And his speech at Bedminster, which is going to be my next newsletter, his speech at Bedminster outlined his case pretty pretty intelligently. Yep. Uh, and the, the, the strange thing, I, and I've said this to him personally, that there's a big Trump and there's a little Trump. And the big Trump is this amazingly historic figure who gave the speech at Bedminster. And the little Trump goes out and does dumb things. Uh, and if he could keep the little Trump under control, uh, he would absolutely be one of the most historic figures that, that, that we've ever had in the presidency. I think there's a little yeah. Trump double entendre in there somewhere. I think but anyway, so, too. Yeah. So do you think he's sweating <laughs> this latest federal indictment? No. Not at I all. Think he's totally pissed. I think he's totally pissed off about it. Yeah. I think he thinks it's, it's crazy. He thinks, I mean, this indictment involves so much violating attorney-client privilege that it, that this, uh, it'll be very surprising if the Supreme Court doesn't throw it out. Because uh, it's just, I mean, they they clearly pierced. They, they basically said to every American, you know, your your right to to confide in your lawyer only exists as long as the Justice Department tolerates it. Well, that is an extraordinary violation of what we have had for 240 years under the Constitution. Uh, that's a good point about attorney-client privilege being pierced. That is a good point. Not enough people have been making that. Um, what about on the other side? If you were House Speaker, if you would providing advice to Kevin McCarthy, would you tell him to uh, file a missing persons report on Special Counsel Robert Hur and the Biden classified documents handling investigation? No, I, I would just tell him to have his committees continue to do what they're doing. I mean, they're gradually, day by day, pulling all this stuff out in the open. The one place I think I disagree is this this document that they got from the FBI. I think should be put on the internet so that every single American can read it. Yep. There's no reason it's not secret. There's no reason to keep it secret. And it can, it's a document based on the testimony of an of a confidential informant to whom the FBI had paid two hundred thousand dollars. And when so the, the FBI and, can hardly dis, they can't disown him. Well, right, but when the FBI deputy director says, as he did in a Senate hearing this week, that uh, we're not disclosing that document, we're not uh, disclosing these tapes that he seemed to indicate did exist, and then he seemed to indicate he doesn't know if they exist. We're not disclosing this because it's a matter of life and death, the life or death of this confidential informant. You know, it's, it's amazing how suddenly they can get concerned when it threatens their clients. Mm. Uh, you know, so, so Bill, Bill Clinton could visit the attorney general on her airplane in Phoenix while Hillary is under investigation, but of course... They talk only about their grandchildren. Sure, right. Um, he was playing golf in August yeah. in Phoenix. Yeah, I mean, right. It's 112 yeah, degrees. I mean, look, the, 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 the whole notion that they believe we are so patently stupid, and Chris Ray is fully as bad as Comer was, uh, who, who, who's fully as bad as, as his predecessor was. But you've had three FBI directors in a row who have been disasters for the country, and I'm, I'm going to write a newsletter in the near future arguing that they should kill the FBI's proposed headquarters, a three and a half billion dollar building larger than the Pentagon, and that they should break up the FBI, return power back to the special agent in charge at the city level, go back to fighting crime, and, and eliminate all of the various intelligence activities that you know that now describe Catholics as potential terrorists and parents who go to school board meetings as potential terrorists. That that is an operation that needs to be closed down, not reformed. He is former House Speaker Newt Gingrich, also former presidential candidate, New York Times bestselling author of the recently released March to the Majority, The Real Story of the Republican Revolution. Speaker Gingrich, thank you as always. Appreciate it. Great to be with you. Thank you. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. It's news, opinion, insight. This is Chicago's Morning Answer on AM560, The Answer. Many novice gold and silver buyers make fatal mistakes when buying precious metals for the first time. Mistakes made because of dealer gimmicks and scams. Dennis Prager here for Amfed Coin and Bullion. My choice, and it really is, for buying precious metals. Numerous precious metal dealers are capitalizing on the demand for gold by selling inexperienced investors collectible coins with outrageous markups. One company charges as much as $18,000 for collectible coins that are only worth about $5,500 in the open market. It's an example of the honesty of AmFed. Other dealers tell falsehoods about government gold confiscation or regulation of gold prices at AmFed Coin and Bullion to keep things simple.